This episode is sponsored by Circle and Bloom. Circle and Bloom has created an amazing offer for the Fertility Friday community. Make sure to head over to circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday to get your free relaxation program. And don't forget to enter the coupon code fertility Friday at checkout to get 20% off of anything you buy. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 114. Welcome to the 114th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Before I jump into today's episode, I just wanted to take a moment and let you know about my group program. So I do still have spaces available for the January 2017 Fertility Friday group program and I am tailoring the group specifically So one group is going to be tailored specifically for women who are trying to conceive and another is going to be tailored specifically to women who are trying to avoid pregnancy. And so I'm really excited about the January groups. I do have a couple spaces open still, but they are starting to fill up. So if you're thinking about jumping in and being part of the group, uh, don't (laughs) wait too long. Once the groups fill up, then uh, registration will be closed. And I just wanted to share with you what one of my clients said about our work together. Yeah, it's been, this is a really interesting time to be answering that question. I think I would have always been very complimentary and would highly recommend it. But after coming uh, recently from a trip for my very first time to go see a fertility clinic and recognizing the just stark disconnection between the mental, emotional, and physical, that they really treat you like here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the boxes. They don't ask any questions. They don't allow you to be an active participant in the most intimate part of your life. I really can't think of anything that's like really more intimate. And so it's like, I came back from that and I like signed up immediately for the, the your alumni group because I'm now used to from working with you being treated with a certain respect and being able to be an active participant and ask questions. And I truly feel like you want me to understand. You're not just blanketly, you know, throwing out this information and hoping it lands somewhere. You really want me to understand. And I think that's just so critical because like I said, this is the most intimate, I think, part of our lives and and important. And so I would definitely say, Um, At least start off with the group session. Not only will you get to work with somebody who has a breadth of knowledge that she really wants to share with you, but also you'll meet other women who are walking the same path. And that in and of itself, just to not feel alone is so valuable. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program for more information. And of course, before I jump into today's show, I wanted to take a moment to thank my sponsor, Circle and Bloom. Circle and Bloom has a number of programs, not only related to fertility, but also programs that take you through the whole process of conception. And once you get pregnant, there are separate programs to take you through pregnancy and delivery. One of the things I love about Circle and Bloom is the intention behind their programs. And so I've talked about their natural fertility cycle program a number of times because I think it's so thoughtful to have a program that takes women through the workings of their entire menstrual cycle. And I love that when you use the fertility awareness method, you can kind of tailor that to your own cycle and because you'll know where you are in the cycle. And so make sure to head over to circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday and you can nab your free relaxation program there. And if you do purchase any of their programs, make sure to use the discount code fertility Friday and you'll get 20% off of anything you buy. So let's hop into the show. I'm so excited to be with you today. In today's episode, I wanted to do something special and share with you my top 10 takeaways from 2016. And so for those of you who don't know, it's actually my two-year podcast anniversary. So happy podcast anniversary to Fertility Friday. And so I started this podcast two full years ago. And when I started this podcast, it's so funny, I have talked about it on the show before, but I really didn't know who would be listening, if anyone would be out there. It it really is me in my basement with a microphone. That's how it all started. And I really felt passionate, obviously, about the message that I I wanted to share. And after two years of podcasting, over 100 episodes, you know, well over 100 interviews under my belt, 
I can really just say that this has been an amazing experience. And the responses that I've got from you, from the audience, from my guests on the show, from all the amazing women that have come into my life, uh, just as a result of the podcast, from all of the women who I've been fortunate enough to work with, all of my clients, I can honestly say that there is a need for, <laughs> for this. You know, I wasn't sure if the message would resonate with women. I mean, I thought it would because I knew it definitely made a huge, profound difference in my life to discover fertility awareness and to discover the way that developing body literacy can impact your life. But I can just say that the response from you has been overwhelming and it has been truly amazing. And I am so thankful and grateful for all of you who tune in. <laughs> I know that many of you tune in every single week and, you know, are excited for the, the release on Friday morning. I, I release my episodes uh, every Friday at midnight Eastern. And so I'm so thankful and appreciative of all of you. And I really do love to hear from you. So all of the emails over the years, the comments on Facebook um, for all of you in my Facebook community. So for those of you who uh, might be new, if, if you've just started listening to the podcast, I do have a Facebook community for uh, Fertility Friday listeners. And so if you head over to Fertility Friday slash community, you'll be directed to that group. And so in there, we talk about the episodes and a lot of different questions about fertility awareness. And, and so this year, I feel like in 2016, I was able to get to know my audience a little bit better. I was able to really get to know who is listening. And that was through my, in, the interaction in the Facebook group. That was through working with a lot of you, <laughs> working with uh, women in my group programs, as well as my one-on-one -on -one sessions. And I feel like it really gave me a good window into who's listening and also why this information is so important. And at least every week, <laughs> I get a couple of emails from women who are so fired up about body literacy and, you know, frankly, feeling quite upset and frustrated, but also inspired at the fact that this information wasn't just available. It wasn't just standard education and, and you end up kind of ha left on your own and, and fortunate enough to stumble on a podcast. And that's how you discover this information. So I resonate with that. I'm there with you. Um, I recognize that it shouldn't be that way. It should be, we, you know, it should, this information should just be available. You shouldn't have to kind of go in this covert undercover manner to find it, but here we are. And so I'm so happy to have you here. And honestly, it's all of the encouragement and feedback from all of you that just keep me so passionate and so driven to share this information with women all over the place. And so I am here. I'm still here. And I know you're there too. So I guess that's the difference between now and two years ago. So now I know that, uh, that you're listening. And so um, I do this for you. And I do this because I, I do want the world to be different. I do want women to know this. And I do want it to be a standard part of just our lives. And I don't want women to have to discover it after 15 years of being on hormonal birth control and then struggling to conceive and all of the things that go with it. And so, you know, one podcast at a time, <laughs> one client at a time, I'm striving to make a difference. And I'm just so, so thankful that you're all here with me. So with that said, uh, let's get into my top 10 takeaways after two years of podcasting. I can hardly believe it. And over 100 episodes. So the first takeaway that I want to share with you is that, you know, women deserve better than what they're getting. So after doing my, uh, all of the interviews that I've done, interviewing all of the different health professionals that I have, having the Fertility Awareness Reality Series, which was a just a really exciting opportunity for me to not interview a professional, quote unquote, but actually just really delve in with one of my clients and what I have gained this year from all of the clients that I've worked with, and you know who you are, and I know that you're listening, is that women, we deserve better support. And I think that's where we're at. And I believe that that's why a lot of you who've listening have found the podcast, because ultimately, there's something inside of you, your intuition, your um, spidey senses go off when you're being told by your healthcare providers that there's nothing that they can do, that you need IVF and you're 34 
or that <laughs> the only thing left for you to do is, you know, okay, well, we'll start with Clomid. And so what I've gathered from all of my interactions with all of you is just that women out there, we're really starting to get to the point where we're, we're not satisfied with the care that we're getting. And we're not 100% convinced that those are the only options. And I think part of it is, of course, due to just having the internet. When I was a little girl, <laughs> there was no internet. <laughs> when I was in high school, I didn't have a computer at home. And, you know, I got my first personal computer when I was 18. So for some of you who are listening who are, say, a decade <laughs> younger than me, or even younger than that, that probably seems completely bizarre that you didn't grow up with a computer. And be, and I didn't get my first cell phone until I was probably 19 or 20 <laughs> or something like that. And the, cell, the first cell phone I had didn't have, there was no apps, like there was no like Facebook. Facebook wasn't a thing actually until like 2007. So you get the picture, right? It was a lot different back then. And I think that with the advent of all of this technology, the fact that I can start a podcast in my basement if I want to and share this information with you, it does make the world a different place for the women there today. And as a result of that, it's becoming more mainstream that women are not satisfied. So there may have been a time when women had to, quote unquote, suffer in silence. But these days, if a woman, say, gets an IUD or she takes a certain type of birth control pill or she uses, uh, you know, the Nuva ring or something and um, she doesn't have a, a positive experience about it, <laughs> well, she can take to the internet and impact, you know, tens of thousands, if not millions of other women with her story. And so I feel that the more we have access to these uh, different avenues to share our experiences and our opinions, that it's kind of like the more unhappy we are, the louder we get. I mean, we're women. <laughs> so suffering in silence is not a thing anymore. We don't need to do that. And it just keeps coming to my attention time and time again that we do deserve better support than we're getting. And what I mean specifically uh, with regards to support is support in all avenues. But, you know, I'm going to pick on support from the medical system. And as more women adopt more of a healthy, natural lifestyle, as more of us move towards eating cleaner or eating organic or eating local, as more of us move to cleaning up our household products and using products that are non-toxic and using beauty products that are estrogenic and those types of things. So as more of us shift that consciousness and strive to live healthier lives, then the less open we are to going <laughs> to the doctor and taking pills for something that just it just doesn't make sense. And also the more in tune we are with our feelings, with our emotions, with our gut instinct, with our intuition, the more we start paying attention to that little feeling in the pit of our stomachs when someone says something to you and you just don't, it just doesn't feel right. And even though you know that most people just go ahead and, you know, fill the prescription for the pill and ignore the fact that they ovulate and have a period three times a year, something inside of you is saying, this isn't right. So this is something that is so apparent to me through the podcast interviews that I've done. But I think it comes much more apparent to me, especially in the client work that I do. When I'm working with a woman and you know, she's been experiencing certain, say, menstrual cycle irregularities for years. And I'm the first person to ask her how she's sleeping, what her stress levels are like, what she has going on in her life, and if she's ever been tested for something like PCOS. So sometimes I feel super frustrated because I'm thinking to myself, like, why am I the first person that's asking about this? I mean, she's been to three doctors right? So ultimately, that's a huge takeaway that we do deserve better support that we're getting. And I guess the encouraging part of that is that there's an amazing army <laughs> of, you know, natural health professionals who are really striving to make a difference in, in this area. And I think that one of the great things about the podcast is it has allowed me to connect with so many different health professionals who are really at the cutting edge of their field. It may not feel to them that they're at the cutting edge because they have surrounded themselves themselves with like-minded health professionals who are also striving for the same goals. But time after time, when I'm working with a client 
and, you know, they go off to their doctor to just request a simple panel of blood work. They're coming back to me saying, my doctor won't order it. Uh, my doctor said that it's not necessary. My doctor says that I don't need that. Or my doctor won't prescribe the medication that I want. They're only going to prescribe this one because that's what they usually prescribe. And so although it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I see the amazing advancements and the amazing possibilities, uh, you know, in terms of your health and what you can do naturally to address your problems. But on the other hand, there's a the very real barrier to that, which is your kind of run-of-the-mill physician who uh, is kind of stuck in their ways. So that's all I'll say on that point. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, apparently I could do a whole podcast on just that one topic that women deserve better. Uh, but I'll move ahead and talk about my second takeaway. So my second takeaway from this year has been that advocacy is difficult. And when I say advocacy, I'm really referring to self-advocacy. So advocating for yourself is not easy. When you're seeking support in a way that is not mainstream, that goes against the grain, that goes against what your doctor is recommending. So for instance, when you have an irregular cycle and you go to your physician, for example, especially for a woman who isn't actively trying to conceive. So, you know, I did an audience survey earlier this year, so I have a, a good idea of who's listening. And so although it would seem as though most women listening to the podcast are trying to conceive. There is a significant amount of women listening to this podcast who are not actually currently trying to conceive. I mean, they might be planning to conceive in the future, uh, some of you, but some of you are just not. Uh, whatever's going on in your lives, you are not trying to conceive right now. And so that's a good example of this. So for example, if you are not trying to conceive and you <laughs> are having uh, irregular cycles and it's come on your radar that that could be a problem. Maybe you're, you're having four or five periods a year. And so you're concerned, uh, especially if you've listened to uh, the, a number of episodes that I've done on PCOS. So I'll link all of the PCOS uh, related episodes to the podcast just because I'm mentioning it to the show notes page. So you go to your doctor and the response might be, uh, A, go on the pill to regulate your cycles <laughs> or B, take metformin and that'll fix everything. And so when you decide for yourself, uh, if you decide for yourself that that option, those two options don't feel right, they trigger the little spidey sense or, you know, the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up because you really wanted something different. Because you really wanted to know, okay, no, no, I want to understand why my cycles are this way. And I want to know if there's anything I can do to improve it. And then you find yourself at odds. And, you know, this is exactly the, the reason why I had Dr. Miranda Naylor on the show. So if you haven't listened to uh, the episode that I recorded with Dr. Miranda Naylor, that was episode number 104. I had her on the show to really get into the doctor's perspective so that we can all get a sense of where your doctor's coming from and how they were trained to support you. And that's where this advocacy piece comes in. Uh, again, this point is related to what has been revealed to me through my client work this year. And it's so difficult <laughs> Uh, when you want to approach things from a more natural, less invasive approach or perspective, and you're excited, you've learned this new information, you believe that you can actually improve your health naturally, you're already diving into different supplements and all kinds of stuff, you're already making changes to your health, you're already making changes to your lifestyle, and then you reach out to your doctor and then you find that you're hitting a wall. So whatever it is that you want, you're not getting. So if you want, are wanting a certain test, you're not getting it. If you are wanting to try a certain type of uh, medication or procedure, you're not getting it. And if, you, if you're trying to convince your doctor that, that for the fertility awareness method is what you're going to use for birth control, that's not working either. So that is the takeaway. Advocacy is difficult. And I want you to know that it's worth it. And it's very important for all of us to advocate for ourselves. So I don't think that we need to rely on quote unquote, Dr. Google and try to figure it all out ourselves. And because there's too much information out there, I think that it's really important 
to find a good health professional who can support you through the process. And I have said before on the podcast that I do believe it's important to have a team because you're not necessarily going to get everything you need from one person. And that's why it's important to understand the role of the person that you're seeing and how they can fit into the entire complete picture of your health. But with that said, if you want the best care possible for yourself, it means that you will have to advocate for yourself. And if you've chosen a path that is not the beaten path, let's just say, so if you've chosen a path that where you you know you you know that you don't feel comfortable taking hormonal contraceptives you are not comfortable going through assisted reproductive technology as your first path if you struggle with fertility challenges and if you basically have uh, an idea of what you want that is different to your current healthcare provider in any way shape or form then you have to expect that it's going to be hard it's not going to be easy and when I say hard, what it means is that if you choose to butt heads with your you know, doctor who disagrees with what you want or thinks what you're asking for is unnecessary, then you should expect that you will have some friction there. <laughs> you might be told no, as if, and you might be sitting in, a, in an office feeling like you're a child again and wondering how this is even possible for someone to tell you no, when you know it's your own body and you know that you have the right to do to request whatever testing that you see fit, you can expect to have challenges. It is not easy. Another way that it, it's difficult is that you may end up having to search a little bit to find a practitioner who aligns with your perspective, a practitioner who is open to hearing what you have to say and open to um, doing a test if you really feel that it's necessary. And that process in and of itself can be frustrating because you may end up having to see several healthcare providers, several doctors, several fertility specialists before you find the right one. And I think that it's important to align your expectations with the reality of the situation. I think that in and of itself would make it easier. So if you know when you're approaching your physician, if you have that in mind, that you may have challenges, I feel that it's you're e better able to handle those challenges. If you know, if you're searching for a new doctor, and you really, you know what you want, and you know what you want that uh, physician to be open to, I feel like that makes it that much easier. If you go into it knowing that, okay, so this is the first time I'm seeing this new doctor, I recognize this may not be a good fit. So I'm going to go in with my questions and share what I'm looking for and really just use this as a, an opportunity to see if we align. You could even go one step further and you could even reach out to a few different physicians in your area uh, or health professionals, speak to their secretaries, give them a call, give the office a call, speak to the secretaries and, and just flat out ask. You know, I was looking for a, a doctor. I noticed on their website that Dr. So-and-so specializes in thyroid health. Could you tell me a little bit about his approach or her approach? Does she, is she open to working with a naturopath? You know, I have a Chinese medicine doctor. If you have that in your mind, that that may be a step that you should take. And if you have it in your mind that you're looking for someone who's a good fit, if you have it in your mind that, that getting that, um, the cooperation of a good physician might take a little bit of interviewing, just like anything else you are looking for somebody, you could almost think of it as like you're looking to hire somebody. <laughs> and so if you were looking to hire a, a doctor, then that puts you in the position where you can ask some questions and you can really feel it out first. So I'll leave that point there. But advocacy is difficult. It is not easy to advocate for yourself. But don't get discouraged on the way because the rewards are worth it. I always say that no one cares about your health and your fertility, your ability to conceive. No one cares about those things as much as you do. And so you are the one that has to rise to the occasion. Take the challenges for what they are, but keep going until you find what you're looking for, whether that being a supportive physician or at least a physician that's open to ordering the tests you require, uh, somebody who treats you with respect, and somebody whose perspective, at least for the most part, aligns with yours. 
so that your interactions can be positive and respectful. (laughs) So you don't have to feel additional stress uh, just every time you have to go see your doctor. The third point that I want to share is that you really need to know how to approach your doctors and get clarity on what it is that your doctor or the health care provider that you're going to, what exactly it is that they do. And so one example that I uh, <laughs> that I often give is you wouldn't go to McDonald's and go to the counter and order a diamond ring. They don't sell diamond rings at McDonald's. That's not why people go to McDonald's. You go to McDonald's for burgers and fries or a flurry or something. I don't know. So you have to align your expectations with what the reality is. And so if you're going to a classically trained allopathic physician and you're looking for somebody who is coming from a functional perspective, who's going to do all of the testing to determine the underlying cause and to really get in there and support you nutritionally, health-wise, to restore your menstrual cycle health naturally, that is not likely what you're going to get. Because uh, it's not to say that your doctor is not concerned about your health and doesn't want to help you to improve your health. But if you look in your doctor's toolbox, your doctor has different tools. (laughs) They have different tools. And so similarly, if you go to a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, they have different tools. If you uh, go to a naturopath, they have different tools. And if you go to a doctor who is trained with a background in functional medicine, they have different tools. If you come and work with me uh, as a fertility awareness educator, then I have different tools, right? I use the menstrual cycle as a tool that guides me and gives me some incredible insight into the underlying issues that could be causing the problems. So each individual that you go to has different tools at their disposal. I feel like it's really important to know how to approach your health professionals and to be really clear on what they do what their perspective is, what they have to offer you. And this is more of a self-preservation thing because it takes a lot of energy and it causes a lot of frustration to fight with somebody who is not going to see things your way. (laughs) And there's no point. So if you find yourself in a doctor's office looking for a certain type of care that really was never on the menu to begin with, and you find yourself arguing with this person or basically kind of causing a stink, you're wasting your time and energy. And ultimately, um, you got to get out of McDonald's and go to the fancy store in the mall that sells the diamond rings. If you're looking for a diamond ring, (laughs) it's probably a bad example. But anyways, I'm going with it just to illustrate the point. So I think that's super important. And number four, the fourth takeaway that I wanted to share with you is about healing. And I feel that it's really important to share that healing is possible, but it doesn't always happen in the way that we think it will in the time frame that we think it should or in a straight line. Healing is something that happens on our body's time and it often, the path to healing often meanders. And so uh, in my client work, this is often highlighted where I'll be working with somebody who we're charting their menstrual cycles. And so we have uh, been doing it for, you know, a couple months. We have a few charts to look back on. And the clients that I work with are amazing, so motivated and inspiring. And they're often making lots of really positive changes in terms of their diet, their lifestyle, stress management, you name it. They work so hard to improve their health in natural ways. And so you have somebody who's working really hard, who's um, improving their diet, who's staying away perhaps from foods that they have identified that they're sensitive to or whatever the case, and they start to see improvements in their charts. But lo and behold, you have a cycle where it, it looks like everything has gone backwards. So while our, the cycle was starting to look a little bit more healthy, uh, perhaps ovulation was coming more uh, where it's, I guess you could say, ovulation wasn't delayed as much. The cycle parameters were starting to look a little bit better. We're starting to see healthier mucus patterns. We're starting to see a longer luteal phase. And then all of a sudden you have a cycle where you've got all of this mucus weird stuff going on that is just not uh, outside of the parameters that it's supposed to look like. Perhaps ovulation is delayed by two weeks. And it's really confusing for my client. And perhaps the luteal phase is super short. And, uh, you know, I then in our session, we, we have to unpack this. You know, I've been doing everything I possibly can. 
I've been working on this for so long. Why is this happening? Why isn't it just getting better? And so I think a really important takeaway is that your body heals in its own way. And it's really interesting because uh, from my perspective, I have been charting my own cycles for about 15 years. And I've also been working with women. And so I've seen not only my own charts, but I've seen hundreds of women's charts in the context of uh, some sort of teaching relationship. And I've also been able to see women's charts over time. So I've seen my charts over time and, and women's charts over time. So when I come into it and when I look at the, a, a woman's chart, I am not just looking at that chart or that day or that one time that thing happened. I'm looking at it in the context of, you know, her whole health or even for myself. The, I have had the good fortune of seeing how much my own charts have changed over the years. So the benefit that I bring into that is that I've seen how healing happens and it doesn't always happen in a straight line. Um, so sometimes it's like three steps forward, one step back, two steps forwards, one step back. And sometimes it's just life. Sometimes, and I think this is something that's come up quite a few times on quite a few different podcast episodes where it's like, I look at the chart, I check in, I find out what's been happening, what's the diet been like, what's the sleep been like. And then I just say, well, you know, did anything happen that week? <laughs> and then, you know, it comes out that, oh, I was traveling or, oh, somebody was, uh, someone in my life uh, really close to me had something really tragic happen or whatever it is. And so I think that what happens in this process of gaining body literacy through fertility awareness is that you really start to have this profound understanding of how intimately your menstrual cycle is tied to everything that's happening in your life. And I love to be a part of that. I love supporting uh, women in finding that and discovering that and seeing uh, really, because it, it really gives you this deep sense and this deep understanding of how everything, you do, how everything you do is reflected back to you on your charts. It's really, really interesting. But I think the important takeaway um, and the reason why I brought this up is because I want this to be an encouraging thought for you to know that healing doesn't happen in a straight line and it's not always in the way that you think it would happen and it's not always in the order <laughs> you think it would have happened in, the way you would have thought that it would have happened or the time frame that you would have thought that it would happen. So I think that that piece of information, a lot of women are probably listening now. So if you're listening now and you're like, man, I wish I would have known that last month when everything seemed like it was all over the place. And then this month, my cycle was great. So just keep in mind, one of the things I always say when I'm working with, uh, when I'm working with women is that one cycle doesn't make or break anything. Everybody has a one-off. Everybody has something that just doesn't make sense that one month. What we're looking for is the pattern. So I'm more concerned if I see something that's consistently happening over time than if I see something that happens once. I'm more concerned about the pattern because we all have a one-off. The fifth point that I wanted to talk about is something that I've focused on throughout my podcasting journey, throughout the over 100 episodes that I've done. And I think that it's so important. Again, this is something that comes up in my client work. And it's that an important part of healing your cycles and restoring your fertility often involves balancing male and female energy. And I don't mean it in a completely intangible way. I actually mean it more of a tangible way. So let me explain what I mean by balancing male and female energy. So this is something that, we, that I've spoken about quite a bit on the show. I've interviewed a number of guests, and this is something that has come up. And so when I say male and female energy, um, in terms of male energy, what I'm referring to is that constant desire to achieve, to strive, and just to, it's, it's that work ethic, right? It's that like, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to go hard and I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to give up. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to wake up really early. I'm going to go to bed late. I'm going to work six days a week. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get done what I want to get done. I'm going to figure everything out. I'm going to learn all of the science. I'm going to understand the whole situation. I'm going to do it perfectly. And I'm going to do it until it works. <laughs> so that kind of energy around striving and constantly working to achieve. And that 
is not intangible because that is the world that we live in. And that energy around striving and achieving is tied to our stress levels. And as I've spoken about in a number of interviews, that is, you can measure that. You can measure your cortisol levels. So this is something that you can measure. And so I bring it into the realm of male energy, female energy, because I want you to just take a moment to to kind of look at that paradigm and see how it could be affecting you. As women, it's really tough to balance these things. We have so many different roles. So, you know, you have the role of professional in your professional lives. So in your work, in your career, what you're doing. And obviously, in order to be successful in your career and your work, you you do have to strive. You do have to achieve. You have to work really hard. You have to show up. Often you have to work long hours and you just have to do a lot of a, a lot of things that require a lot of your time and energy. And in our culture, kind of our dominant paradigm, what is respected, what is considered to be superior is that scientific, knowledge-based, striving, male-type energy. Whereas on the flip side, the female energy is less doing, striving, achieving, um, cerebral, finding all the answers, knowing it all, reading a scientific study, (laughs) and is more intuitive more in tune with your body, more in tune with your feelings, your emotions, trusting those intangible things. So if you walk into a room and you have a feeling that maybe it's not the right thing that you leave, but you can't explain why, because it's more of a feeling more intangible. Also resting, the, the whole idea of like not, it not being lazy, but resting, regenerating. And the creative energy, think about mother nature. So if you go for like a walk in the forest, (laughs) you see all of this creative energy. And I guess the reason that I'm bringing this out is because although you may not think that this is relevant to you or that it impacts your life, I see it in the charts. (laughs) I see it. And that's why I'm talking about this. So I will bring it back to the very specific. So the tool that I use when I'm working with my clients is their menstrual cycle chart. And so when a woman is off balance with respect to her masculine and feminine energy, and she's stressed the heck out because of all the demands on her time and her energy, um, perhaps she isn't super happy in her job, but she needs it to pay the bills. And this is the reality of life, right? you just see that imbalance showing up in the chart in terms of stress. And so one of the things that you've noticed that I've spoken about a lot on the show is stress management. I've done a lot of shows on stress management. I've done a lot of different episodes on different ways to, um, to kind of recharge, to really understand the role that of stress on the adrenal system and how deeply of a role it can play in the menstrual cycle. And I guess the interesting thing that I've learned from my clients is that, I mean, it's really important, first of all, to be aware. It's really important then to try to take time for yourself. And so, for instance, to take time for some prayer, some meditation, some mindfulness, some visualization. It's really important to take, uh, you know, a couple minutes for yourself each day where you can kind of connect to your feminine energy. You know, for some of my clients, that might involve something like uh, taking a little bit of time to to do some coloring. It could involve listening to a guided meditation, uh, like the Circle and Bloom meditations, or you know, whatever it is, uh, sitting quietly, going for a walk, but just doing something that connects you back to the feminine energy. But for others, that's not enough, and it's really not practical to say like, okay, so I can see that your job is totally stressing you out. Your boss is a crazy person and every day you go to work and your stress level goes to a 10 and then you're there for 10 hours and then you come home, you have nothing left for yourself, let alone your partner. And then, you know, you just go to bed and do it again the next day. And then we look at your chart and we see just this pattern of depleted stress because that shows up in, in a number of different ways. And so um, you can't really say like, so it looks like the solution to your problem is that you might have to consider shifting to a completely different occupation because this one isn't serving you. Or you may have to consider, I don't know, like you may have to make some, some big choices, I guess is what I'm, gonna, what I'm trying to say. So that's a really long way of saying that one of my takeaways from this year is that an important part of healing your cycles and your fertility often involves balancing 
that male and female energy, to not let yourself be taken away too much with the striving and to remember to take that time for yourself to reconnect with that feminine energy. And as a mother, so as someone who has had children, what I can say is that when you bring children into your life, it's not that you fit your kids into your life. It's that I don't want to say your kids are your life, but you end up fitting everything else around your kids. So before you have a baby, you think that, okay, I have this job, I have this relationship, we have this great house or whatever it is, and then I'm going to have kids and they're going to fit into this picture that I've created for myself. But what happens is something really different. Perhaps the reason why the striving and the stress and all of those things are you know, not highly correlated with fertility is because in order to bring that into your life, you need to make room for it. You need to make space for it and you need to connect with that energy around it. And by doing so, you deal with all of the scientific stuff. You know, you reduce your cortisol levels, it improves your hormone balance. But in terms of the emotional aspect of it, I think it's very interesting that the connection there as well. So this brings me to my sixth point, which is that every woman will fit fertility awareness into her life differently. And I think this is a really, really important point. Fertility awareness, the knowledge of when you're fertile, when you're not, the knowledge of how to use this information to prevent pregnancy or to achieve pregnancy, to use this knowledge to understand what's happening with you health-wise, every woman is going to apply that to her life in a different way. And one of the things that I have learned from my clients is just the multitude of different reasons why women want to learn uh, the fertility awareness method and also the multiple different ways that women apply it to their lives. And so a good example of this is, uh, so if you're listening and you can think of a time in your life where you were absolutely not open to having a baby, you were just like, I need birth control. I can't, this is not a good time. (laughs) I can remember, obviously, when I was in university looking for birth control, I was not open to a baby. I needed birth control and I I needed to finish my college degree. I I just, it was not a good time. And so I was charting in a very specific way. So back then, um, and I still chart in a very specific way, but uh, I just want to use this as an example. So uh, back then, I was very, very aware of the fact that I was actively trying to avoid pregnancy. And so I was meticulous with my charting. You know, I I charted every single day. I marked all of my observations. And um, I was very clear on which days were potentially fertile and which days were not. And so I acted accordingly. And I didn't make a a slip up. (laughs) I just was very intentional about it at that time. And I think a lot of you listening um, can relate to that. I mean, if you're using this method to prevent pregnancy, um, you're going to come at it from a, a, in a very specific way. And so when I work with women who are very much not trying to conceive, they are typically extremely meticulous with their charts. Because they want to be super clear, like which day is fertile, which day is not. I want to know the rules. I want to understand it. And I want to be really clear because I want to be responsible. Obviously, that's why we take the pill. That's why we use condoms. That's why we use fertility awareness so that we can um, be responsible and do what is best for us. But in another example, as our lives change, as we get into the different seasons of our lives, these things change. And so although there may be a season in your life when you know, like you are just avoiding pregnancy like the plague, (laughs) the seasons may shift at some point and they may not shift immediately to the point that you want to have a baby today, but they may shift to the point where you're kind of open, right? You're like, well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We're kind of preventing it. And so again, when a woman is charting her cycles with fertility awareness, she can use that information in whatever way she, she sees fit. So for a woman who is kind of open to a pregnancy, not 100% opposed to pregnancy, if it happened, we would definitely keep it, but we're not actively trying right now, then um, she may still chart meticulously. But if she misses a day or if she sees mucus and the mood takes over, she may choose not to actively uh, use the actual method. She may just leave a little bit of that up to chance. And that that's completely okay. (laughs) Uh, And that's my point. Every woman uses this method differently. 
in that particular case, if a woman is having, you know, unprotected sex on a day that is fertile, that she's identified as fertile, then obviously she's not using the method for birth control. But the point that I'm making is that each woman does use this information differently. And I think that that's the beauty of the method. So one of the things that I do with my clients is I just try to understand where they're coming from. You know, what are your intentions? Are you um, actively trying to conceive? Are you actively trying to avoid pregnancy? Are you somewhere in the middle? And then we just go from there. And so my role in that situation is to help her to be really clear on her cycles, to be really clear on uh, how to use the method, which days are fertile, which days are not, uh, what the rules are around that, so that she knows And then every day she can make an informed decision as to what she's going to do about it. And so I think that uh, that is the beauty of the method. And I can't say like there's no right and wrong way to use it. I think if you have a clear understanding and you're really, really clear, like you know the method inside and out, you don't have any confusion around your mucus and you are super clear, you know which days are fertile, you know which days are not, and then you're making a choice based on your intentions, I think that then obviously like there's no right and wrong way to know the information. But I think it's important to have a good understanding first. And I think that's kind of the pitfall for for some women who are a little bit, say, overconfident before they're really sure of what's happening. But again, I think the beauty of fertility awareness is that it really gives you that ability to know what's happening in your body to understand the different phases of your cycle that you're in, that you might be in on any given day. And then it empowers you to make those decisions based on your intentions, what's best for you. And this brings me into my seventh point, which is that although fertility awareness seems like it should be intuitive, I think that it does take work to get to the point where it's easy. And one thing that I would encourage you, if if you're just starting to learn the fertility awareness method and you've started charting your cycles, it's all really exciting and new. I want to encourage you because eventually you do get to a point where it's really easy. It's like tying your shoes or something. Like it's just, you don't really have to think about it. But with my clients in that, you know, those first, that first session or, you know, that first month, it can feel like a lot of information because it is. And so although when you think about fertility awareness, you kind of have this, well, I I can't, I don't know what image you have in your head, but I know what kind of comes to mind for me is this whole idea of like, just this wonderful unison, in unison with nature, just like this wonderful symbiotic relationship that just happens naturally. And I could actually relate that to my idea of breastfeeding before I had my first baby, because I kind of thought like, oh, I'm going to be in the forest. It's, you know, birds singing and breastfeeding is just going to be supernatural. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think that there, that it could even be a challenge because it's just natural. Right. But then, you know, enter my first baby and it was the most stressful (laughs) three to six weeks of my life. I can tell you it was the most stressful. There was so much I had to learn. There was so much I didn't know after we got through that onboarding process. And if any of you are curious, I will link to an episode that I actually did on my friend Lori Eisenstadt's podcast. She has a a podcast all about breastfeeding. So if that's a topic that you want to learn more about, I would definitely uh, suggest her podcast. But she interviewed me on her show. And then I shared my whole story about breastfeeding and why it was so challenging and how we got past it and all that kind of stuff. So really interesting if you're wanting to actually uh, hear more about that. I'll link that episode in the show notes. But the the point that I'm making is that I thought it was supposed to be natural. I thought it was going to be easy. So, so much so that I didn't even think I had to give it any thought beforehand. And what I discovered was that it was not natural. (laughs) It was not easy until it was, right? Until I crossed the point that it was, it became effortless somewhere between eight to 10 weeks in. And now at the time of recording this, I'm still breastfeeding now my second child. And it's like putting on your shoes, like it's like nothing, but it didn't start out that way. I had to learn how to breastfeed. The baby has to learn because the baby doesn't know how. (laughs) I know some of you are like, what do you mean the baby doesn't know how it's it's natural? But you have to learn, the baby has to learn, like you both have to learn and you have to figure this out. And yeah, although it's beautiful and natural and eventually you get to the point where the birds are the, singing in the park and everything's wonderful, it doesn't, it didn't start out that way for me. And I think in a lot of ways, it's very similar to charting. And so I would encourage you not to get lost in this idea that it's just this 
automatically going to be this intuitive thing because it's not. Many of my clients and many of the women that I've um, encountered over the years have never seen their mucus, touched their mucus, didn't know what their vulva looked like. I mean, for a lot of women, this is just isn't a regular conversation <laughs> where you talk about the fluid that comes out of your vagina. And so although you do get to the point where it's super easy and intuitive and you have this really deep understanding of your body and you can really know when you're fertile and when you're not and you can take it for granted and you don't have to think about it and it's a habit and you don't have to worry about it, it doesn't start that way, not at all. And so um, if you're feeling defeated or you're feeling like there's something wrong with you because it's supposed to be easy or if you're confused about your mucus observations, know that that's normal and know that that's part of the learning process. Even though it's, again, even though it seems intuitive and all of those things, it's not something that I don't, I, in my experience, so I can just speak from my own experience, in my experience, I don't feel like it's something that you can 100% learn completely by yourself. And I think that's why there's so many forums and so many groups online and all of those things because, uh, and, you know, Kandara has a community and it's because you really can't learn it all by yourself. Like if you just had you in a book, you could get really far, like you could really get a decent grasp. But in terms of all of the nuances, all of the shifts, as I alluded to earlier, all of the different seasons that you go through in your life and the different changes that your menstrual cycle that will happen to your menstrual cycle throughout your life, whether it's um, having a baby kind of puts a kink in the menstrual cycle, it changes it, breastfeeding changes your uh, menstrual cycle, stress changes your menstrual cycle. If you have an endocrine disorder, uh, like a thyroid issue or PCOS, that changes your menstrual cycle. So many things change it and change it overall, but also change it for periods of time. And so uh, yeah, um, that's one of the, my important takeaways, which is that it seems as though a lot of women think that it's going to be intuitive and super simple. Um, and then they go about it and try to do it all themselves. But really, you'll, you're going to need some support. And you don't need support for a really long time. You might just need support for a period of time. So, uh, so get some support in the beginning. <laughs> Have somebody help walk you through, hold your hand um, through the beginning stages of it. And then you can really get to that place of confidence and um, it will become intuitive, but it, it, it you do, absolutely do not start there. And I can confidently say that because for me, I had that. So that's what brings me to where I am today. That's why with my own cycles, I am really clear on, you know, what days are fertile, what days are not. I've been using the method for almost two decades now. <laughs> and uh, it's served me throughout all of these different challenges, uh, through breastfeeding, through avoiding pregnancy for the majority of the time. And then the short periods of time that I was using the method to conceive, it's taken me through all of that. And I would not have been as confident or uh, comfortable throughout all of those periods of time had I not learned from women who knew more than I did and women who had more experience than me and women who were certified and trained in teaching fertility awareness. My eighth takeaway, this is, it's almost like a fan favorite, or that's what I would say. I don't know if that's the truth, but I get at least, um, say, two or three emails every week from women saying, basically, like, thank you so much. I found your podcast. Oh, my goodness. Every woman should know this. Why doesn't every woman know this? And it's something that comes up in my group programs. It's something that comes up in my one-on-one -on -one client sessions. And I am including it as a takeaway. <laughs> Uh, one of my takeaways, and so on a personal level, is that the more that I see that feedback, the more that I hear that from you, the more that it reinforces how important this knowledge really is. It just uh, reaffirms why I started the podcast in the first place and also how important that it is. Sometimes I wonder, um, what if I hadn't started the podcast? Like, what if I had just kept it to myself? What if I had just let my fear of I don't know, sounding like uh, a weirdo on a, <laughs> on a radio show, uh, let, stop me from sharing this with, uh, with you. And so I'm really happy that I just did it. I just jumped in and started. And I'm really happy that it's been making a difference. And I continue to see the need for this information and knowledge. And it's so funny because after having this knowledge and taking it for granted for so long, um, I think I've shared that before, that before I started doing the podcast, 
I had just been quietly charting my cycles. I had been doing some teaching in terms of fertility awareness in, in the group that I was part of, but ultimately I wasn't making a big ruckus. I was just charting my cycles and living my life. But when I had my first son and I saw friends of mine, close friends of mine struggling with fertility challenges, and I realized, you know, most women have could not tell you when that short five to six day window of their cycle is that they can conceive. Most women just don't know that the period that you experience on the pill is not a period, that it's a withdrawal bleed. Most women don't know that the pill can negatively impact your cycles in a number of different ways. And most women don't know how intimately connected their cycles are to their overall health and fertility. And the fact that your menstrual cycle can be used as a tool to give you information about what's happening in your body and your health. And so that was what drove me to start the podcast because I, I felt an obligation. I was like, you know what? This is ridiculous. Like, I can't just sit here and not share this. I need to, to get it out there because it's vital information. I mean, this information can save women tens of thousands of dollars. So for some women, this information is enough to prevent them from needing IVF. For some women, this information is enough to help them to identify an underlying issue that's preventing them from conceiving. Some of the clients that I work with, this information is enough to help identify some serious issues that would otherwise not be identified right away and can really help them in their fertility journey. And so that is what keeps me passionate. That's what keeps me working. Um, that's what keeps me here every Friday. <laughs> and also my own curiosity, because I, I love to learn new things. I think you can tell the show goes where my curiosity goes. If there's something I want to learn more about, I learn more about it. I, you know, search for amazing health professionals that have more uh, knowledge and specialization in those areas and use it as an opportunity to learn more. And so, yes, I agree with you. Every woman uh, does need to know this. And um, I would love to hear your ideas of how we can make that into a reality because you never know who's listening. And so I always think to myself, I wonder who's listening. Maybe there's a woman listening who is in charge of a massive, you know, education network where she has access to thousands of schools across Canada or across different states in the United States. And maybe, just maybe, she's listening to the podcast and she can create an opportunity for, you know, millions of teenagers boys and girls to learn this most basic information about their body that we all should have learned. So you never know. All right. Number nine. So I couldn't share my takeaways with you without throwing the pill under the bus one more time. <laughs> but um, yes, number nine is that uh, my takeaway is that the pill has a det detrimental impact on a woman's health. You know, a lot of you who have listened to the podcast, especially those of you who have listened for the majority of the past two years, you might be wondering, well, that's pretty obvious. How is that a takeaway? This year, uh, and I keep referring to my client work because I feel like that has given me the best insight into who's listening and into the intimate way that this knowledge can impact a person's life. And Maybe I get too emotionally involved, but I, it really bothers me on a deep level to, to see people suffer. Like it really, really bothers me. And so this very thing, how the pill can impact a woman's health, has been the reason for a lot of the, the podcast interviews that I've done this year. And so one that stands out in a big way is episode no, number 95, uh, the episode that I uh, recorded with Dr. Susan Rako. And that was about the impact of the pill, essentially on, um, a, a, you know, a bunch of different factors. But uh, we really got into how the pill impacts a woman's cervical health. And so throughout my client work this year, I was really kind of faced with the fact that there are a lot of significant impacts. And it doesn't mean that the pill is causing them, you know, I don't want to get sued or whatever. But it's not necessarily a direct causal relationship. For instance, in the case of cervical health, the pill has been known, and you can find the scientific research to back it up, to negatively impact a woman's nutrient stores in a number of areas. And so it depletes specific nutrients. So for instance, nutrients like folate, folic acid, B vitamins, so, you know, B12, it depletes vitamins like zinc. So it has a number of negative effects in terms of a woman's nutrient stores. And that's just to name a few. The pill is also associated with 
negatively impacting a woman's gut flora. So it also has a negative impact on her gut health. And then uh, the longer that she's on it, the more pronounced these impacts can be. And, you know, another way that the pill can impact a woman's health is that it covers up whatever is going on. So if a woman had a pre-existing menstrual cycle issue, so for instance, if a woman did have uh, PCOS symptoms or uh, cardiometabolic syndrome, where and, and she was taking the pill to quote unquote regulate her cycles, which we know that it, it doesn't regulate them, but if that's why she was taking it, then behind the scenes, even though she's getting this fake bleed every month, behind the scenes, she's whatever disease process is going on is still going on. And it's just that now her body's alarm system has been unplugged. So, uh, but whereas before she would have been very aware that there's a problem because she never knows when her period is coming and goes months without having one. Now she gets this fake bleed every month to reassure her that everything's okay when everything is not okay. So whatever is the problem is still the problem. And it's just that now she doesn't have any evidence of it. She It's just happening in the background. So that when she goes off of it, the disease issue process that's been going on is so much worse now. And the pill has been masking it. So the pill, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so I've had a number of shows, as you know, about the pill and the way that it can impact a woman's health. I had a, a really powerful episode with Dr. Laura Bryden. It was episode number seven. To list off all the episodes I've done about the pill, I think would take a long time, but I'll just list a few. I had an episode with Holly Griggs Spall, one of the early episodes. So our first episode together that if you haven't listened to that, uh, it's episode number 21, What Hormonal Contraceptives Really Do to Women. And uh, she wrote the book Sweetening the Pill. And so we delved into that. And I think, you know, if you haven't delved into the archives and you haven't listened to those early episodes and you do have, if you're curious about the pill and the different ways it can impact a woman's cycle, I would say start there. Start with those two episodes because the ways that the pill impacts a woman are different perhaps to the ways that you would have thought. So where you may have thought, okay, well, I know it increases your risk of stroke, especially if you smoke. But did you know that it can increase your chances of depression, anxiety in measurable ways? Did you know that it can impact a woman's sex drive? And in some cases, in a permanent way, it just goes on and on and on. But I guess bringing it back to my point that, you know, the pill has a detrimental impact on a woman's health. I think the impact that the pill can have on cervical health was quite jarring. So Dr. Reiko, you know, in her research, she uncovered that there was this link between long-term pill use and risk of death from cervical cancer. And she was trying to figure out why that was. And so initially she thought that perhaps women who are on the pill are less likely to use condoms and therefore they are more likely to to be exposed to HPV and therefore they're more likely to get cervical cancer. So she thought that was the logical reason. But then when she actually delved into the research, she found that regardless, that was not the reason. She found that women who were on the pill for a longer period of time. And so if, if the longer that you're on it, we're actually more susceptible to contracting HPV. Because if you took women who were not on the pill and women who were on the pill and exposed both parties to HPV, it was the women who were on the pill that were more likely to actually contract the disease. And so that would indicate that the pill has a negative impact on a woman's ability to fight off the disease. So we have immune systems, we and we we know that, so our immune system is responsible for fighting off viruses, illness, you know, all those types of things. But the pill does something to a woman's immune system as in a specific way related to her cervix that makes her more susceptible to contracting the HPV virus if she is exposed. And so that is something that she uh, uncovered in her research. And so that was a huge takeaway for me this year, because in my work with women, it's something that I see, and I see it frequently. Women who have a history of pill use, 
I see are, you know, more likely to, to have that history of HPV, more likely to have had um, abnormal PAPs, more likely to have had cervical surgeries. And what these women are not being told is that if you take out a piece of your cervix, it could have a negative impact on your ability to produce cervical mucus in the future. And if you have a limited ability to produce cervical mucus in the future, that can have a negative impact on your ability to have children. And I don't know if the doctors who are performing these surgeries and are aware of the link between the pill, first of all, the reason that you're more likely to contract it. So starting there, I'm not sure if they're educating uh, these women on the relationship between cervical mucus and your ability to conceive. And so um, on a very personal level, I'm extremely disturbed <laughs> by these trends. And I feel that it's really important for all of us to, to have more education around these areas and to be properly prepared and educated around what the risks are. So I feel that all of the potential side effects of hormonal contraceptives were never on my radar when I was 16 and I was put on the pill. And I would be curious as to how many of you knew in advance before ever taking hormonal contraceptives, the link to depression, the link to anxiety, the link to cervical health, uh, the link to gut health and you know, all of those things that I mentioned, like how many of you actually feel like you were properly educated on these risks? It doesn't mean it's going to happen every single woman, but we should know the risks. You should be able to make an informed choice. So, (laughs) okay, rant over. And so the last point that I wanted to share with you today, my last takeaway is the power of community. So this is coming from a personal level, from my own experience, as well as my experience now facilitating group programs with women. And I think I alluded to it earlier that as women, we do crave community. So we do thrive in that collective type of environment and not just any collective, but a specific group of women who are also going through a similar season of life, similar challenges, similar struggles. And I feel that in the world that we're living in today, um, it can be really isolating, especially if you are experiencing uh, fertility challenges or health challenges. So I know one of the comments that I get a lot in my groups is around (laughs) our new Facebook culture. So like I said at the beginning of the podcast, you know, I didn't have Facebook when I was growing up. That was not a thing in my life. And so I didn't grow up with that constant weird Facebook comparison thing that's going on. So everyone puts their shiny, happy pictures on Facebook of their families and their kids and their partners and their whatever, their new car, their house, I don't know, everything, all the things, they put them all on Facebook. And I think when you're, you know, when you're trying to conceive them, you're, you know, you're doing your thing and then your period comes and then up pops a new pregnancy photo shoot for your best friend. (laughs) And it just makes it really hard to it just makes it really hard. Uh, You feel like you're alone. And so the power of being part of a group that is also experiencing a similar season of life, who gets what you're experiencing, who you don't have to explain it to, who you don't have to justify anything to, who just understands and just supports you just because that's what they do. I think it's important. And it doesn't mean that, you know, your friends are not good people. It it just means that as we get older, so, uh, you know, for me, as I've I've gotten older and as I've come to different seasons of my life, I realize that, you know, you have a lot of friends that you have that are super close to you. But sometimes when you're in a particular season of life, it's also helpful to have friends who are in that season of life. So for instance, if you're, if you're, experiencing challenges getting pregnant, if you've been trying for a while and it hasn't been happening, if you've been trying for over a year, if you've been trying for almost two years, if you've had a number of miscarriages and you don't have someone in your life who has also experienced a very similar thing, then it can feel very isolating because even your friends who love you may not know what to say. And you may not be able to say what you need to say because you want to protect them. You want to, you don't want to burden them. And so this comes to play on in so many different ways and on so many different levels. And for instance, as well, when you get pregnant, when you start having kids, like life changes when you have kids and 
it's not in the ways that you think. Kids come with all kinds of different challenges that the things that that come up, I mean, the ways that it can change your relationship with your partner, the way that it can change your relationship with your in-laws, the way that it can change your relationship with yourself, uh, the way that your body can change in unexpected ways, the way that your cycles can change, the way that your sex life can change. (laughs) There's so many things that can change. The way that you used to think about your work and your career can change the way that you look at all these different types of things. And when you're going through all of that stuff, um, if your best friend isn't necessarily at that same stage, then you may not be able to fully get the support you need or get that level of understanding. So I can't stress enough just the power of community in whatever phase you are in your life. And you can tell that I'm passionate about it. I mean, when I was learning fertility awareness, um, I feel I, I look back on that time so fondly I was so fortunate to be part of a group of women and there was maybe five, six of us, seven of us, depending, you know, some women were there for longer than others. They'd kind of move on. But I was learning in that in the context of a group and we met every month and I was being taught by professionals who had the background, the history, the training to not only teach me how to chart, but also how to understand my health and understand how it intersected with my chart. And That experience made a profound difference in my life. And I learned so much more by being around women who were also doing it in different phases of their lives. You know, here I was trying to avoid pregnancy. And, you know, there was a woman in the group who was actively trying to conceive. And so we were in the group together and she got pregnant and she had her, you know, first child. And I was able to see and learn from her experiences and see how her cycle changed and and how it was different when she was breastfeeding and Uh, Even though I wasn't there yet, those experiences stuck with me and I guess you could say prepared me for the different stages of my life. And so that's why I'm so passionate to create group programs because I know how powerful it is to have that community and I've experienced it and I feel so blessed to be able to create that for for other women. So um, that's the takeaway and and facilitating those groups and creating those groups has had such a profound impact on me. We've cried together (laughs) in the red tent. We've laughed together. Uh, We've shared so many things. And it's a place where (laughs) anything goes. The running joke was TMI Tuesdays. So I hope the red tent uh, sisters don't mind me sharing that. Uh, But that was the running joke because basically we could ask any question. We could share anything. We could talk about any bodily fluid, (laughs) any excretion in an environment where everybody gets it. Everybody understands and everybody's supportive. And so um, I think that has been one of the most amazing experiences that has come out of uh, the podcast. I, I don't think I anticipated that when I started my podcast two years ago, and it's made such a big impact on me this year. And so, of course, I had to share that with you as one of my takeaways, because honestly, it's just been amazing. It's been a lot of fun. And so those are my 10 takeaways for the year. So I hope that you enjoyed my little ramble, but I wanted to share that with you. I wanted to share a little bit about what I've been thinking throughout the last year and what has really stood out for me in doing the podcast. And I mean, obviously I could just go on and on and on, but I wanted to share with you because I think every year when this time comes around, it's always a special time for me. I look back and I just think to myself like, wow, like I'm still doing it. And I look back at the episodes that I've created for you and that I I look back and I think of all the women who I've, women and a few men that I've had the opportunity to interview. And I'm really proud of the body of work that I've created. And I'm, I'm really happy that it's been resonating with you. I'm so encouraged by all of the feedback that I get from all of you. And so uh, you're the ones who I'm doing this for. I podcast for all of you. And I'm really happy that I've been able to, to produce this show for you over the past couple of years. And so in terms of what's to come for 2017, I have some interesting ideas. I have some ideas for uh, interviews, some topics to talk about, uh, some great things that I want to kind of delve into. I have some ideas for different programs and different things that I'd like to do with my audience. And so uh, I think 2017 is going to be 
even better and even more exciting. And so I just want to thank you. I say it so much, but I really do appreciate it. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be able to to share all of this information with you. And so that brings me to the end of my anniversary episode today. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 114. And I still do have a few spaces open in my group program. If you're looking to start 2017 on the right foot, if you've been looking for an opportunity to get the little kick in the pants that you need to make some changes in terms of, you know, your diet, your health, things that you know that you should be doing, but you just are not going to do it unless you have a bit of accountability, the group will give you the accountability. (laughs) We will be there uh, with encouragement, knowledge, information, and support. At the time of recording, I still have space in both groups. So I've created a group specifically for my ladies who are trying to conceive. Um, So it's a mixture in the group. Some of uh, the women in the group have been trying to conceive for a a while, and they're looking to gain some insight into their cycles and what some of those underlying issues could be. Some of the ladies in the group are planning to conceive in the future. So just wanting to really prepare, prepare their bodies, really get a handle on the fertility awareness charting aspect of things before. And then my second group is my ladies who are trying to avoid pregnancy. So at this point in time, they are are really just wanting to understand the method for birth control. They want to be super clear on the rules and really get to that place where they can be 100% confident. Perfect use of the fertility awareness method is is not only possible, but it's actually fairly easy, but it's only easy once you know the rules and once you are confident about your observations once you're really clear on the mucus. And so the method I teach gets you there. For more information about the group program, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. If you know this is something that you want to be a part of, make sure to apply uh, as soon as you can, because once the groups fill up, then the doors are closed. (laughs) For more information, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group programs. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. If you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, just shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. And I just want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast. And whether you are going for a walk outside and I don't know where you are in the world, but if you're in Canada it's probably kind of cold. So if you're enjoying a a lovely walk in the cold, or if you're on a completely different side of the world and it's beautiful, or just a different part of the country, thank you for letting me uh, be part of your day. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.